Hi guys, welcome on in. Um, sorry I'm a couple minutes late. I was having some Wi-Fi issues, but look what I have here in tow. Oh, it is a copy of Prince Harry's new book, Spare, and it is very, very long. So if you don't want to buy it and you don't want to read it, I will spare you the money. And we're going to be breaking down part one today. I hope you are ready. We have a lot to break down. So here we go. Oh, hi, it's me, Zach Peter, pop culture junkie. Reality TV insider, published author, and host of the No Filter with Zach Peter podcast. Here I'll bring you all the latest news on The Real Housewives, deep dives into celebrity legal scandals, and unfiltered combos with your favorite stars. I've got you covered. And yes, I always keep receipts. So be sure to hit that like button and subscribe for all the latest tea. Now, let's dive in. What's going on? Welcome on in, guys. Welcome on in. Today, we are recapping part one of Prince Harry's new book, Spare. It is out now. I made sure I went to run and grab myself a copy hot off the press, and I tried to read through most of, of at least part one. So the book's broken up into three different parts. Part one is, is 57 chapters long. So we made it 37 chapters, almost all the way there, and we'll break down part one. And then next week, we'll break down part two, and I guess whatever's left of part one. And then the following week, we'll break down part three. So you will get it in chunks, parts one, two, and three throughout our Tuesday Zach Pack Weekly Unpacks, which are streamed live every Tuesday, Tuesday evening on the YouTube, youtube.com slash Zach. And I will be sharing the rebroadcast on the podcast. So if you're listening to this on the podcast, know that it is a rebroadcast. Also, guys, I just wanted to give you a heads up that next week, the week of the 16th, I will not be here. I will be out. I will be... Um, with my family on vacation. I'll still be working-ish, but I won't be recording that week. So just a heads up, all of next week's episodes will be pre-recorded because I will be out of the country all next week with my family. Um, I have not taken a vacation. I don't remember the last time I took a full week long trip that may have been like Dubai a few like many, many years ago or back in like 2018, I think. So it's been a minute. Um, so just a heads up, everything next week will be pre-recorded. So if there's any breaking news, follow the Instagram account at no filter with Zach or stories. I'll be sure or not stories. Sorry. YouTube shorts. will will definitely keep you guys posted, but all right. So let's dive into it. Like I said, I tried to make it through most of part one of the book and it is, it's a lot. So it's called spare. By Prince Harry, and boy, does he really try to make us feel like he is the spare in this book. So the book opens, and he describes his experience with the Balmoral Castle. Balmoral, sorry, the Balmoral Castle. He brings up a 1997 summer at Balmoral. Princess Diana was not there because he says at this point she was no longer a part of the family. His mom was off with her new friend, which is how the family would refer to this mystery man, even though he wasn't much sort of a mystery because here she was out with this other man and it was just her new friend. That's how we'd refer to him. So he says that he and William did not really care for her new friend, her new friend. But as long as this new friend made mummy happy, that's all that mattered to him. That's all. So, and that, this is all part of part one out of the night, out of the night that covers me is what it's called. Um, prior to that, he does open up the book with discussing his grandfather's funeral. This is what I thought was really interesting. So before we even get into part one, chapter one, there's a whole prologue, right? And so here he starts talking about his grandfather, Prince Philip's funeral. Right out the gate, he's just ready to put it all out there, mention it all. Let's start with what went down at the funeral. So he has a lot of like sweet anecdotes, remembering how Prince Philip was, you know, the biggest advocate of his beard and how um, he was an advocate for his parents wanting, or for his parents dating. He speaks very kindly of Prince Philip. He speaks kindly of his mother, noting that he doesn't remember much of her, as you'll remember in the Netflix documentary, he seems to not remember much of her there either, but he remembers her smile, her eyes, her childlike love of movies and clothes, her love of sweets, and how much she obsessively loved her two sons. She des he describes her as very pure, a very pure and radiant light. He said that the, Win the Windsors had always been at war, especially at this point, so all she ever wanted was for her boys to be good and not at war. 
even if that meant not being at war with Prince Charles, who was their father. So he says, um, now here was Harry waiting to meet his father and his brother at the funeral. And he said that it was odd because he hadn't really heard from them. He'd been like calling them and texting them. And he was like, okay, I'm at my grandfather's funeral. And, you know, obviously he wasn't, I don't believe he was there publicly, right? Wasn't he like not allowed to attend? So anyway, he is trying to make nice because his mom wanted them to always make nice and to not have any contention, which is really interesting that he decides to open up his book with that, considering the book drags a lot of people and we'll get into all of it. So he says that he was worried when he finally saw his father, Prince Charles, who was prince at the time, now he's King Charles, when he saw his father, Prince Charles and Prince William walking towards him. And he says that it reminded him of seeing his mother's coffin. And it reminded him of going into battle for the first time. And it reminded him of going on stage and having an anxiety attack. So I'm not really sure how all three of those scenarios can be compared, let alone compared to this moment. You know, I mean, I guess like intensity, anxiety, adrenaline, but like seeing your mother's coffin in comparison to, you know, going into battle for the first time in comparison to having an anxiety attack in comparison to seeing your dad with a worried look on his face, hardly comparable, but whatever. This is his experience, right? So he also says that they were surprisingly calm at the funeral, which was interesting because it's like, okay, were, were they angry and, and looked worrisome or were they surprisingly calm? Which one isn't, Harry? He said that he tried to explain his side of things to his dad and his mother, but he also wanted to make sure he kept his emotions in check. He didn't want this to become an argument because that's not what his mother would have wanted. He said that they came looking for a fight and that every time he tried to talk, he was nervous, so it was troublesome for him, but William kept shutting him down. And then Prince, or sorry, King Charles was like, don't fight, guys. I want you to keep it nice. Like We shouldn't be doing this. You guys are family. We're your brothers. And Prince William kept claiming he had no idea why Harry and Meghan left. He's like, I don't understand what this is all about. I don't understand what you guys are making such a big ruckus about. You're just causing drama, just to cause drama. And Harry's like, oh, if he can't see why we left, then maybe he never really knew us at all. And then Prince William and King Charles were just kind of like, what is your deal, dude? So apparently he tries to make it seem like they just didn't understand him and they never have. So Prince William and Prince Charles, if you're watching this, I can tell you why Harry left. Harry left for money and Harry left for freedom. Okay, that, that's really the honest truth to it. He wanted out of the institution. I don't think he ever really cared for it. Um, and then when he saw an opportunity out and a cash grab, he was like, all right, let me sell up my family. Let me bring in that dough and let me leave this life. And that's why he's throwing you under the bus right now, right out the gate in his new book. Just dad and brother straight onto the straight onto the flames. He says that he wanted to tell them why, but that it would take too long to try and get them to understand it. And that they just weren't in the right headspace to listen to him and to listen to his concerns and to listen to his worries. So that's what this book is. This book is his chance to explain it to Prince William and King Charles and all of us as to why you know, he needed to get a $10 million paycheck to write this book. His book deal was reportedly worth $40 million, but it's a four book deal. So this right here, Prince Harry earned himself a nice $10 million paycheck. Um, she, she says, as a therapist, Prince Harry speaks way, way too much of the too much for the Prince of Wales. He speaks way too much for him interesting why won't he give up the royal title if he's so disappointed with the royal family he's jealous as well as greedy and petty i don't think he's jealous uh maybe a little jealous i don't think he's well i don't know i mean he's definitely petty okay so let's get into it so like i said then we open the book with part one out of the night that covers me where he talks about diana and diana not being a part of the family anymore because she has a new friend he continues on by saying um this is an interesting piece. He says that his memory is how he remembers things and that it's not always as true as so-called subjective facts, which I thought was interesting. So I'm like, okay, so you're outright saying this is my book based off of my memory and it may not align with any of the facts that you guys have out there, but that doesn't mean that I'm lying. It's my truth. You know, everybody has my truth. I'm like, okay, so you're right out the gate telling us that this is probably not going to factually add up, but just so that we know, this is his truth. It may be wrong, it may be inaccurate, it may be factually incorrect, but it's still his truth. Got it. 
So he describes living in the castle, his dad doing headstands and his boxers to help with his back pain, the queen and her slippers, the beautiful architecture. He says that he was often referred to as the spare by his parents and by his grandmother. William was their heir. So he was just the spare. He says, um, I was brought into this world in case anything ever happened to Willie. I was the backup. I'm like, okay, Solange, calm down. Like Beyonce's doing a number. It's not that dramatic. So he talks about always, like it's it's pretty, for any sibling that has an older sibling, like it's pretty on par with what it's like to have an older sibling and to kind of feel like you're in their shadow a little bit. So he talks about the joke that his father made about how Princess Diana gave him an heir and gave him a spare right before he was off to be with his girlfriend, Camilla. We get into her too. So right away, he's just airing all the, the dirty laundry, right? We're talking about our dad in, in, in the boxers. We're talking about him with his mistress, Camilla. We're talking about the, the funeral and them basically attacking him at the funeral and not understanding where he's coming from. We'll see if the same laundry gets aired on himself and his own wife, Meghan Markle, down the line. But as of right now, he's just really throwing everybody out there. So he said he took no offense to being considered the spare, though. It's just what it was. These were the circumstances that he was dealt with. He further describes the castle, the lawn, the garden. It was so perfect as kids. They loved riding through the garden. He describes how, you know, it was it was the same but different because, you know, as kids, they still ate fish sticks, except their fish sticks were served on fine china and served on silver platters with like butlers that had black ties and black shoes. So he says that they mostly had a normal childhood, you know, just painted up by the luxuries of being a royal. They had fancy sheets, they had exquisite bedding, but they were just kids at the end of the day. He was just a kid living in a cloud of innocence. And then his whole world changed. And he remembers the night his whole world changed because his father came into his bedroom, white as a ghost, and he told Harry about Princess Diana's car crash. And he was waiting for him to tell him, oh, okay, mom was in a car crash, but she's all right. And he said he kept waiting for his dad to explain that, like, despite the fact that mom was in a car crash, she's okay. She's going to be okay. And he says that he kept referring to him as his darling boy, which he normally called him. But this night, especially, he kept saying it over and over. Oh, my darling boy, my darling boy, my darling boy. And he explained how his mother, Princess Diana, didn't make it. And then Harry remembers everything just kind of coming to a startling halt. Harry says that he didn't cry. His father didn't hug him, but he did tell him that it was going to be okay. And he rubbed his knee. Harry says that he stayed in bed until 9 a.m. the next morning when the bagpipes began to play. And, you know, the bagpipes are not really what you want to hear because they're not very comforting. They're rather excruciating. And all they did was exacerbate the grief that he was feeling losing his mother. It's chapters like these and these types of moments that for me are really endearing. I think these are the moments where the book is the strongest, where he talks about his own personal experience with like grief and losing his mother and how he speaks kindly of Princess Diana. I think those are sweet and relatable moments. The grief, the shock, all of that I think is rich. The scandal of it all and the outing as family members, not so rich. Very, very tacky. So we keep going. He remembers the funeral. He remembers uh, clasping his father's hand, which caused a media frenzy. And everybody was like, oh, my God, he's clasping his father's hand. Photos, photos everywhere. Paparazzi following me. So he said that he didn't want to believe that his mother, Princess Diana, had died. He felt like it was all a trick. He thought that she had staged the accident and ran away from the unrelenting media. And she just she couldn't bear it anymore. And he just didn't want to accept or believe that she had died, which I think is very honest and very real, right? He says, mommy would never do this to us. Mummy is what he calls her. Mummy would never do this to us. It really does sucker punch you having him retell his grief. And I can imagine, obviously, writing this, that was also very challenging for him. He says that his aunt um, ended up bringing him two locks of his mother's hair, which was just more reassurance that she was gone. And at first he was like, no, this has to be somebody else's hair. This can't be my mummy's hair. And that was kind of just like where it really started to sink in for him. He talks about how he and William had to face people. They had to go out. 
He remembers seeing all the flowers that people would bring. He remembers talking about meeting strangers who would cry over the loss of his mother because that was his mother. But these people were, you know, the Commonwealth and they didn't really know Harry and they didn't really know his mom. But he says that he didn't cry, that he was just very blocked off and he just tried to quietly cope. It seems like there was a bit of some disassociation that was going on. He goes hard at the press for killing his mother. Definitely throws that out there quite a bit. He says that the public funeral was a lot for two young boys, which I would agree with. He details how there was a possibility of him being too young to have to walk down behind the casket. But he says that, you know, that would have never been a consideration with William. He ultimately did end up participating in the funeral. And there he finally broke down and sobbed, which he says he felt guilty about. He felt guilty for crying and sobbing because that broke royal protocol and you're not supposed to cry in public. He says that everyone just moved on after that. And then it had to, his birthday came just a couple weeks after, very shortly after. And all he wanted was for his mother to be there. His wish was that his mother would be there when he blew out his candles. But then his aunt gave him a gift, something his mother apparently bought him before she passed away. And that was an Xbox. And he was very excited to have an Xbox. He talks about being in boarding school. He says that it was really strict, but the adults, you know, they didn't help the situation because they weren't very nice. But he did love Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays because on Tuesdays and Thursdays and Saturdays, they would have a whole smorgasbord of sweets. And he loved to just dive into the sweets. So he remembers writing a letter to his mother at boarding school to say goodbye after her passing. And it was kind of his way of processing that she was officially gone. King Charles had to go on tour after Princess Diana's death because apparently his approval rating had tanked. Harry also discusses how parenthood was just not natural for his father and he maybe wasn't the best father. He remembers his public outing, his first public outing after Diana's passing. It was a Spice Girls conference, or sorry, not a conference, a Spice Girls concert. He says that he remembers the press being there and that they didn't really care about him. And all they cared about was making money off of him and profiting off of his grief. He talks about how at school, many of his teachers were sympathetic, but some of them were not very sympathetic and they gave him nothing, no ounce of empathy. He said that it was hard being part of the royal family as the spare. He really leans into the spare thing. Like we really, like just like how we really hammered in the Princess Diana comparisons to Meghan Markle in the Netflix documentary, we really like relentlessly cannot let go of the title of spare, right? Which to me, like I feel like any middle kid would feel that way, right? Any middle child, anyone that's... I don't know. It just, it feels kind of standard in the hierarchy of just like siblings. You have an older brother and you have a younger brother. It feels very standard and like a sibling rivalry, but he definitely leans into being just like, you know, second, not, not even just second fiddle, but like really being just insignificant, right? It's a lot of victimhood. Um, and that's what makes some of the book really un like challenging to get through because it's just like constantly what was me. But he says that nobody cared about the spare. So learning about his family's history in school was just not important for, to him. He didn't care to get good grades because nobody cared about him. He was just the spare. Listen, I can have sympathy for him, but like, come on, you're a teenager. Any teenage boy under these circumstances, I feel like would be uninterested in school. And I don't know if, you know, he really gave this, like, did he, do we really believe that he gave this much thought? into being the spare middle child syndrome can relate exactly Brittany. i think that's a great point the xbox came out of 2001 diana died in 1997 uh, that's a good uh, listen gwen is on it i listen gwen i'm not here to fact check anything because he said very much out the gate fact checking is just not a thing we don't do fact checking because the facts might not be in line with his memory and what he remembers so that's an interesting point Gwen made that comment. The Xbox didn't come out for a couple more years. Listen, Harry didn't cut it in the army. They had to bring him back with excuses. He didn't pass at school or Sandhurst not passing at anything. Now he just used Megan to get out. I mean, that's kind of my sentiment, Carrie, but let's get back to the book. So for me, and I guess I have a question for people in the UK, not necessarily in relation to your experience with Harry now, but those of you growing up that remember the, the passing of Princess Diana, when you looked at Harry and William, when you looked at the royal family, 
was your understanding or idea of Prince Harry as just the spare? Because he really leans into this title of just being the spare. And he continues to reiterate that. And I don't know if that was like the consensus publicly that he was just the spare and like insignificant in that way. So we keep going. He talks about his BFF, Henna's who was also named Harry, but he called him Hennes. And Hennes cared a lot about him. Hennes was his biggest partner in crime in school. No matter how often the two of them got into trouble, he says that nothing compared to the pain that he felt on the inside. No punishment could ever hurt him the way the grief that he was dealing with was hurting him on the inside. Talks about Diana's quote of there being three people in her marriage, but Diana forgot about him and his brother, and he was so hurt that she would say there are three people in her marriage, but like she didn't mention him and William, him and Willie. He talks about Camilla, and he says that Camilla made an, she made an effort with them, and that you know initially he was worried she might be the typical evil stepmother, but she wasn't. She was nice. They were willing to forgive her as long as she made prince charles happy and they were willing to accept her but apparently the only thing they begged was that her father or their father not marry camilla because they thought that it would cause a media frenzy if they got married and it would pit diana against camilla which i mean i guess ultimately happened but he said that camilla began petitioning for the crown shortly after that the second she came in she was initially ready and gunning for that spot he then speculated that there were some press leaks regarding private conversations that they would have and then you know starts to cast camilla in this bad light saying that she hired this press guy and the press guy would obviously go and leak things out there he definitely it's very interesting because he talks about how like you know she's not an evil stepmother and she was really nice and she made my father happy and then all of a sudden she turned into the evil, evil wicked witch but it's interesting how she can you know, come in. And suddenly when she comes in, she's ambitious. She's petitioning for the crown. She, you know, is not thinking about anybody else but herself. But when people say that about his own wife, when people try to cast those same accusations at Megan, he very much is like, no, never. My wife is perfect. She's, she's Mother Teresa reincarnated. She's Diana 2.0. So it's interesting that he cast these stones at Camilla, but yet will not tolerate anybody casting even an ounce of a, of a stone at Megan in this same light. Is Harry like Megan who can't remember what he says one day and then lies the next day? I mean, listen, he seems to be such an advocate for his mother, but now he's a victim, unpopular opinion. No, I agree. He's very much a victim and I, he's become such a victim. Whereas I feel like he wasn't, I mean, I don't know. I wasn't that familiar with the Royals prior, but I just don't feel like this is what I remember of him in years past. But maybe it's that he just felt this need to like want to be important, to feel important. And obviously when you're in the Royal family, it's like the most important family in Great Britain. And so it's like, so you're the least favorite of the most favorite family in the country. So you want me to feel bad for that? Not that there's not, I mean, not that, I, like, I don't want to be an asshole and I don't want to have no sympathy for him, but it's also just like the victimhood is just very, it's a bit of a lot. He remembers going to school with William and he says that William would tell him to say that they didn't know each other. And he was really hurt by that, but he was just William Spare. It's like, my God, like this sounds like an older brother. When you go to high school and your older brother's there and he's like, oh my God, we don't know each other. Don't talk to me. I don't know you. You don't know me. Like, just don't even look at me, right? You don't know me. It feels like that. It doesn't feel like William's like, no, you're just my spare. I'm better than you. Like, it feels very natural sibling rivalry, right? He says that it was hard to fit in that he was one of the problem students, or so he felt. He begged to find a friend, someone that didn't care that he was a royal or that didn't care that he was just a spare. <sighs> Says that because he felt like an outcast, he fell in line with a bad crowd. And he remembers smoking cigarettes and smoking weed, and sneaking swigs of beer, right? So he's owning up to smoking cigarettes, smoking weed, sneaking swigs of beer, being a problem child, not really being interested in school right so he's owning up to all of these things right he's like very much like yeah that's what it was i wasn't interested in it remember that for later 
So after getting his hair made fun of, because everyone's like, oh, you got red hair. I mean, they probably didn't call Well, I'm sure they called him fire crotch, but like fire crotch on his head, right? So he said that someone as a joke convinced him to shave his head. And so he was like, yeah, I'll do it because he was a bit of a rebel, rebel. And so he ends up shaving his head. And then he says that that was like a total nightmare. And he was so awful. Like he was so taken aback. And he said it was such an awful experience that he shaved his head and he ran upstairs to his brother, William. And that William was like, oh my God, dude, like that's crazy. And was like laughing. He's like, can you believe my brother was laughing at me because I shaved my own head. You shaved your own head. You were a teenager. You were a knucklehead. You were a dumb kid that did dumb shit. Like it's not that unique to you, Prince Harry. And then it became a headline in the press. And he's like, can you believe they wrote about me shaving my head? Granted, I think the headline was that they called him a skinhead. But I mean, he literally shaved his entire head. Like, you know, they did the same thing. Like they dragged Britney when Britney shaved her head. Not to say that Britney wasn't dealing with her own mental health issues, but it's just like the press is ruthless. I feel like we needed more people to maybe protect them as kids, maybe on the inside, maybe someone to kind of coach them through having to deal with this public life. I think that probably would have been beneficial for them. But it's also like Prince William doesn't have these same accounts. Like Prince William doesn't feel like his life was over as a result of being in the royal family. Granted, they're siblings and they're going to have different experiences. But as Harry said, his experiences might be lies. So believe him. Then he breaks his leg, right? And he's like, oh my God. And then that became another headline that I broke my head and I was in the hospital. And he said that he hated that article because it just, it made him look like a delicate flower. He said that he was nothing more than a cartoon character for the press. He said that the worst part of it was that, at a, was that these articles were poorly written. It was bad literacy. That's what was so upsetting to him is that these were, as even though he didn't like the characterization of the articles, they were poorly written articles. And I'm just like, really? Didn't you just say you were smoking weed and drinking and you were a problem child and you hated school and you weren't into school and you didn't like learning at school, but your your biggest complaint, like the most heartbreaking piece of all of this is that they were written with poor grammar? Very melodramatic. Like I'm trying to not be as dramatic. Like I'm trying to give you some of the theatrics that come from the book without like making you think that I'm trying to like make it more dramatic than it actually is, but it is very dramatic. Like the theatrics and the way that it's written are very dramatic. He says that he didn't want to be naughty. He wanted to be noble, but that he was just really bad at school. Yet he was so concerned about the literacy of the press over an article with his bald hair. Just saying. He said that his father was a scholar and his father loved to read and his father was smart, but Harry wasn't, or not that he wasn't smart, but that he wasn't good at school. So he wasn't interested in books. He hated reading. Harry says that he tried, he tried to read Hamlet, but that he wanted to enjoy it and just couldn't. And that trying to read Hamlet was torture for him. Again, I promise I'm not trying to be any more <laughs> melodramatic than the book. <laughs> So now we have Harry being sent off to Africa with Prince William, right? And there is where he fell in love with the wildlife. And he said, oh my God, it was like a dream. Listen, it's a cute book. It has moments of endearment. It has moments of like pulling back the veil of the royal family and what it means to be royal and living in the castle. But it also feels like just very whiny. Not a ton of self-reflection, not a ton of accountability. If, you know... If he isn't painting himself as a victim, then he's casting stones at other people, mostly his family and the press. He definitely comes across as very scorned. Um, and to me, that makes it really hard to have any sort of like empathy for him because it just seems like he's bitter about something. He's got a chip on his shoulder and he's like, I got a bone to pick. And so I'm going to pick it by making myself a victim. As a royal, apparently you need to keep distance, right? So he says that you can never cross a line between monarch and child or heir and spare. So if we can never cross a line, okay, let's just break this one piece apart, right? You, can, you can't cross a line between heir and spare or monarch and child, yet he's complaining that his father, I mean, I, okay, I guess it kind of makes sense. His father wasn't really the best father. But it's like, then how are you mad at your father if it's just like the way things are in the royal family? I don't know. It's just, I wonder if he thinks, oh, wait, the comments. Are, I wonder if he thinks Las Vegas son is bad literacy. Who leaked that, Kate? I mean, yeah. <sighs> I think she made him believe she's a mummy sub. 
do you think Harry sees Megan as a mummy substitute? Oh, and you're saying, I think he definitely has mummy issues for sure. Yes. Thank you, Aaron. Guys, please tap that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you're enjoying this. More recaps of Spare by Prince Harry will be coming over the next couple of weeks. Make sure you stay up to date with them. I'll probably also do a video breaking down the Anderson Cooper interview. I think that might be kind of fun. Um, okay. So we get into Africa and how he went to Africa with Prince William, not his father, and all the creatures there intermingled. And he loved that because it's royal. All the walls were up and there's all the separation. He's like, it's not like that in the wild. It's not like that with the elephants and the giraffes. There was no affection in the royal family. And he loved how free the animals were in Africa. He says that as the youngest, he was um, punked quite a bit. He said that he liked to be tough, though, that he was scrappy and he liked to throw down and he was definitely a bit of a rebel. He says that it's really because he just wanted to feel something. That's why he wanted to be a rebel. That's why he would get scrappy. That's why he would shave his head because he just wanted to feel something. Again, it feels very much in line with the teenager that has a rebellious streak. Most teenagers have that rebellious streak. He loved his brother, but when they'd scrap with the other kids, he felt like he had to protect his brother and all he wanted was his brother Willie to protect him. He makes it seem like his brother casts him out quite a bit as kids. And so I'm like, okay, was well, this why they're not as close now? Were they ever really close? What about this relationship? that you miss, right? Because he's over here saying, I miss my brother and I want my brother back. But it's like, you make it sound like in the book, like your brother was never really there for you. So was he there and you miss that you don't have that relationship as adults or he was never there and you wish that you had a relationship like that. And if this is true, like I can understand why he'd want to get away, right? If he really was this detached from his father and his brother and he really did feel like such an outsider, Got it. I get why you want to run away, but then why go off and do interviews about how much you wish that you had your brother back and how much you wish that you had a better relationship with your father and how much, like, I get it. If you want to get out of the royal family and you think that they're all fucked up, then good. Leave. They're all fucked up, right? It's just, it's interesting. Um, He says that he always felt like Prince William or I guess Prince William always felt like Harry got away with more because he was the younger child. And I was like, wow, imagine being the heir. And there's a lot more pressure on William than I think that there would be on Harry. So not that I don't have sympathy for Harry because I definitely do, but Harry definitely believes that he's the most important person in the world. And we definitely get that with all of his, you know, his, um, interviews and the book deal and the Netflix deal. Like we're definitely trying to paint him out to be the victim for sure. The biggest victim, not just a victim, but the biggest victim. He says that as a rebel, he remembers sneaking cocktails with his 101 year old great grandmother. She liked herself a gin martini. And he said that nobody cared when he snuck a drink with granny. He said that nobody even noticed. Not noticing and not caring are not necessarily synonymous. They're not necessarily the same thing. But he does speak very highly of his great-grandmother. He says now that he wishes he was more mature enough to ask more about her life and more about her experiences because she was just so wise and now he doesn't have that same opportunity. Then we talk about the drugs, right? Because he says that he would get stoned at school with his peers. They were naughty, naughty boys. And he remembers sneaking into the bathroom to like sneak a little puff and it was Sneak in there and pass, puff, puff, roll one, smoke one. We all just having fun. Mm -mm. Roll one, smoke one. We all just having fun. Blueberry bet. My first time here and I like your takes on Harry's book. Thank you. I try to give honest and real takes. He, he was allowed to his grandfather's funeral. Oh, okay. He paints himself as the victim. Not just a victim, the biggest victim. So he says that he would play a lot of video games and that was his way of escaping reality. And he talks about Club H and Club H was this little hideout from the press's eyes because they couldn't find him in there. And so he would love to just go off in there and get away. And Prince William would go away and, and it was basically their little clubhouse, right? Prince William would go there too. And when they would hang out in there, Prince William would try to talk about their mom and he would try to bring her up and like have real heart to heart talk. 
even though apparently there's separation, you can't have emotions and your brother wants nothing to do with you. But yet here's his brother is at club H wanting to connect over their mother who has passed away. And Harry's like, no, 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 no. We're not going to do that. Harry claims that he was the, the one that was too emotionally unavailable to go there. So I'm like, okay. So then we're talking about how your brother was trying to connect with you and your brother was trying to relate to you on one thing that you guys could really bond over. And that's the grieving of the loss of your mother. And yet you're shutting him out. So then we can't fully blame William for why our relationship has fallen apart. Like there's zero accountability from Harry. We're now into chapter 33. This is chapter 33 that we're into. And I'm just like, where is the self-reflection? You know, then there's Marco and Marco was like their guide. He was looking over them like an advisor, I guess. And so Marco came to, to Harry one day. And at first, Harry thought that Marco, he looked very serious. So Harry thought, oh, no, he probably heard that I had lost my virginity to an older woman. The older woman loved horses. And so she treated him like a young stallion. And she smacked him on the bum on his way out. But they hooked up behind a pub. The story, like, now, because obviously we heard about the story when it broke in the press, but the story now, in the context of the book, feels very randomly salacious. Like, what was the point of this story? Why did we need to talk about you losing your virginity to an older woman? Like, to me, it's just like, what about this was necessary? It's like when he talks about him and Prince William being circumcised together, and now his mummy would never stand for, you know them not being circumcised and how dare the press say that they had hoods on their dicks their head yeah a little hood on their dicks it's like why do you need to out that your brother has a circumcised penis like it's just it's very interesting the choices he decides to make throughout the book right so marco approaches him and apparently it's about drugs and him doing drugs because the press now found out that harry had been doing drugs on campus and the writer who was going to publish the story had a lot of evidence Harry said that the press was really just trying to hunt him because he was the spare. And then he denied everything. And he told Marco, none of that is true. I'm not doing drugs. Drugs? What? Ew, David. And the angle was that Harry was a drug addict. And Harry said that his father would protect him. His father must protect him. His father wouldn't allow it. An article to get out about him doing drugs, even though we know he was doing drugs and drinking and sleeping with older women. So he brings up this spin doctor. That's how Harry describes this man, the spin doctor, who was initially hired, as he claims, by Camilla. So Camilla hired the spin doctor, and the spin doctor would make sure that they had a run on how the press goes, right? And the spin doctor decided that, you know what? We're not going to protect Harry. Rather, we're going to let the spare fall on the sword to protect Prince Charles, because Prince Charles would now no longer be known as an adulterer, but this would be reframed so that it would seem that Prince Charles was now just a struggling father who was now a single father, even though he was dating Camilla. And this single father was struggling with the troubled drug addict son. But I thought that we wanted the royals to look perfect, not like a struggling father or a drug addict. Like that's, again, contradiction. He's saying that that the spin doctor wanted it to look like Prince Charles didn't have a grasp over Prince Harry, who was spiraling out of control because his mother died and Prince Charles couldn't, couldn't get a hold of him, right? Because they thought that that would sympathize, that the audience would sympathize with Prince Charles if they read a headline like that. But then he also talks about how, like, we have to make sure that we always look good and we always, we don't have emotions and we don't cry and we have everything under control. So I'm like, so what was the narrative that they wanted to paint? I'm confused. And then he blames his family for the article going out. He says that it was basically a public sacrificing of the spare. Do we believe this? Do we believe that his family was like, we're going to put up our 17 year old spare and throw him to the wolves. And this was deliberate and intentional to make him look like a drug addict. Or is it possible that he was really doing drugs and sleeping with and sleeping around campus and drinking underage and the press just happened to catch wind of it and we're going to run with the salacious story based off of Prince Harry's own actions? Because he says that the editor who was going to publish the story had photos of him at a rehab center. But Prince Harry claims, just like he claimed to Marco that he had never done drugs, Prince Harry claims that the reason that he was at the rehab facility was because he was doing charity work at the rehab facility. As a teenager, you were doing charity work 
as a teenager at the rehab facility. I just, I want to believe him. I really do. But I'm also just like, I can't. Like, Harry was doing drugs. Harry was drinking beer with his peers. He was having sex with an older woman. Like, these things really did happen. Why are we upset that it, I mean, I get it. It's hard that it got leaked, but you can't be mad and say that my family put me up, you know, for public subjectification and they, you know, threw me to the wolves and I was just doing charity rehab. Like what? We're doing charity rehab. It's just, it really is something else. Um, And this was as far into the book as I got. I got up to chapter 35. It's a very long book. So I'll make sure to continue to recap the chapters as we go. Harry literally confirms every rumor ever put out there. Exactly. He confirms that all of the rumors that were out there were true and these things really did happen. But I guess his argument is that, oh, well, the only reason they leaked was because my family was plotting against me because they wanted to make themselves look good. The royal family doesn't kill a negative story with a negative story. They try to kill it with positive stories, like with Beatrice wore Queen Elizabeth's dress for her wedding. Yeah, Harry literally, yeah, he confirms everything. My sister's the middle child and deaf had middle child syndrome. So she became ro- a rocket scientist at the age of 20 and built a sick house with a private beach at 22. Some people handle it differently. I guess so. I mean, but he's not a middle child. He's a younger child. He's a younger child in the royal family. Like it's hard for me to have that much sympathy. Or is it a rehab charity? No, he says that the photos of him were at a rehab. They caught photos of him walking into the rehab with Marco. And he's like, no, 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 no. I was only walking into the rehab because I was doing charity. And I was going to go help all of the drug addicts at 17 years old. They needed to hear my story of not smoking weed with my peers on campus. They needed to hear from Prince Harry. Again, I don't know if I believe it. I don't know if I don't believe it. This is just what he writes in the book. We're, I would say, two-thirds of the way through part one. We got up to, what, thirty chapter 35? So it's a long book. We'll continue to break it down more, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. It's really hard because it's like there are moments where I do feel for him, and there are moments where I'm like, okay, I get it, you know, and my heart does hurt for you. I got it. I want to have empathy. I don't want to be an asshole. But I'm also just like, but like you can't have it both ways. And listen, I'm pretty sure it was a shitty upbringing, right? You're a kid. You're being ripped apart by the media. Your family's being scrutinized scrutinized in the media. You lost your mother. But it's also just like Harry didn't have the same pressure that William had because William was in line to become king is in line to become king after Prince Charles, right? William's second in line. So William will likely become king unless he passes away. And then if he passes away, it goes to his kids. And if anything happens to his kids, then it will eventually make its way down to Harry. But it's just, he's what, sixth in line for the throne, I believe? Or maybe not anymore now that it's Prince Charles and then it would be William and then William's three kids. So Harry's fifth in line now? I, yeah, I believe Harry's now fifth in line for the throne. Um literally don't know how to react. Oh my God. Thank you guys for all the super stickers. I am seeing them come in. Sorry. There's a lot coming in that I want to give you guys shout outs. Um, thank you. Sabrina. Chica. Oh, nine. Thank you. Sabino. Sabina. Chica. Sabina. Chica. Sabina. Chica. Thank you. I appreciate that for the super sticker. Thank you guys for the super stickers as you're sending them in. Zach, I love your logic. You make shit make sense. I mean, I try, Mary. When it doesn't make sense, then I'm like, make it make sense. Let's do this. It's hard to read because he's so paranoid and none of the narratives make sense but are somehow all conspiracies. Yes, MT, I agree with you. It's just all of the narratives make him the victim. And I'm like, okay, at what point do we take accountability? At what point do we say, yeah, I was smoking weed and I was doing coke and I was smoking cigarettes and I was drinking beer and I was underage and I shouldn't have done it. And was I dragged into the press? Yes, I was dragged into the press. Was it fair? No, it wasn't fair. Was it hard for me? Yeah, it was really fucking challenging because of the pressure of being in the royal family. So yes, as a teenager, I was, you know, 
I dabbled into things that I thought were going to make me feel better. But he doesn't say that. He's like, I just needed to feel something. I needed to be a rebel so that I could feel anything. I needed to do cocaine in the bathroom because otherwise I wouldn't feel anything. My brother didn't love me. Even though my brother wanted to connect with me, my brother didn't love me. My brother would want to talk about our dead mother, but I didn't want to talk about our dead mother. For my brother never wanted to connect with me, and my brother couldn't be bothered by me, and I was just his spare. If I had a brother that wrote this shit in a book, I would be livid. Livid. I would be like, what the actual fuck? Did we grow up in the same house? In my opinion, it's obvious he's still using drugs. I don't know if I would say that, Gwen. I don't think it's obvious that he's still... I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if he was still, you know, snorting some... Listen, now he's in Hollywood. (sighs) As for being a spare, a thousand years ago, a thousand years of spares in all royal families require spares. Newsflash, Harry, you are not the spare and have not been since William had kids. That's a good point, Jacqueline. He's no longer the spare. He's like the spare way down the line. His kids are the spare. What's, um, oh my God, why can I rem- not remember any of Prince William's kids' names? Those are the next three spares in line. That's probably why he's even more pissed. But here's the thing. I don't think Harry ever wanted the crown. I don't think he wants to be king. I don't think he likes being part of the royal family. That's cool. Then say that. Listen, it was too much pressure. I didn't want anything to do with it. Was it one of... um? Sorry, I'm still new to the royal family. I'm still trying to learn all the family trees and stuff. But Prince Charles, now King Charles, doesn't he have a brother? And one of his brothers didn't want to be prince, right? And he dipped out. Or was that one of Elizabeth's, Queen Elizabeth's siblings? One of the siblings. I think it was one of Queen Elizabeth's siblings, right? And that's how she became queen. Again, guys, don't drag me. I'm still learning. I'm a dumb American. I have blonde hair. Like, give me a break. Um, I'm learning, okay? I'm learning a whole other culture. But... If memory serves me correctly, there was Prince Andrew, Prince, not Prince Andrew, Prince Philip. I don't know. There was one of the princes, Prince Bruce. I don't know. One of the princes that was like, I don't want to be a part of this. So I'm just going to peace out. I'm going to relinquish my opportunity to take the crown. And then, you know, it is what it is. The Sussexes have de- the Sussexes have denied stories, and then they write or say something that confirms the stories are true. Their credibility is zero. Yeah, I agree. Their credibility is is zero because the stories keep changing. I actually did a good podcast with Jacques Peterson, who hosts the Unpopular Podcast. We just did a podcast that came out this week about that and how the way Meghan Markle and Prince Harry are able to get away with these things is there's always a kernel of truth in there, and they would just blow it up, blow it up, blow it up upload up to make it a giant popcorn but that's not actually the case but there is just like a teeny tiny nugget of truth in there yes guys tap the like button hit the subscribe button hit the bell notification button that way you always get pinged king edward yes king edward is the one he was elizabeth's uncle okay got it got it got it so you guys understand her uncle yeah abdicated that's right that is i remember that i remember that happening um, the queen's uncle, his dad's older brother abdicated the crown is who you are thinking of. Yes. See, so it is possible. You can just say, Hey, peace out. I'm done. I don't want to be a part of the Royal family. I'm good. See you later. You don't need to go and slam the Royal family as a result of it as well. Like to me, it's just, <sighs> it's interesting. King Edward. That's, that was his name. Not King Bruce. King Edward, Elizabeth's father took the throne when his brother, Yeah, when his brother stepped down to marry, who I believe was an American. See, great point. King Edward, that would have been the perfect stage for Prince Harry to follow. Okay, guys, the new part two of Spare by Prince William will come out on, it'll be streamed next Tuesday. It is going to be a pre-record, so I'm just letting you guys know that now. It will be pre-recorded. I'm going to tape it this weekend, but it'll still stream at our regular time on Tuesday. But just know I'm out all next week, so anything that comes out on the YouTube or on the podcast next week will all be pre-recorded over the weekend because I am going to be out of the country. So just know. I will probably still pop into the live chat and be chatting in the live chat, but just know it won't be an actual live stream. 
just as a heads up. And then I am going to rebroadcast them on the podcast this week, next week, and then the week after that. So that way you guys can look forward to listen. If you missed any of the live stream or you only popped in for half of it and you wanted the full recap, they will be available on the hashtag no filter with Zach Peter podcast. Just because like I said, I'm going to be out of town. So I'll make sure we stream those on the podcast as well. That way you can listen to them. And if you guys like that, then maybe I'll do more of those. Maybe we'll release more of the book clubs and the documentary or our Zach Pack weekly unpacks that are every Tuesday. So no live streams next week. We will still be going live this Thursday as we always do on the YouTube and the Instagram. I do have to run early tonight or not early, but I have to end right on time and I can't go longer because tonight I'm going Harry Hamlin. I'm going to meet Harry Hamlin. Harry Hamlin. Um, he is having some event tonight, like a, a Q&A tonight that I've been invited to attend. So I will be going to that tonight. I don't know if Lisa Rinna will be there. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe we'll see if anybody gets up in arms the way they got up in arms that I met Sutton Strack and there was a photo of Sutton and I. So we'll see. He's in the same cult psychotherapy deal. Yeah. When you read again, think of him as a human being telling his story. Enjoy it. Listen, Gammy, I was thinking of him as a human being. I've constantly tried to give him the benefit of the doubt. He is a human being. He's a very hot human being. Listen, if Harry slid, if Harry slid into my DMs the way he slid into Meghan Markle's DMs, I would not say no. I would be like, yes, let's do it. So I do see him as a human and I do have a giant heart and lots of empathy for him. But he makes it really hard for you to really understand his story without fully just seeing him as the victim. Like all he wants you to do is see him as a victim. And my issue with people that have that victim mentality is there's no self accountability. There's no, let me try to figure out how I contributed to that issue and what I learned from it. Because when you cast a stone and you paint yourself as just the victim, then you don't grow, you don't learn. And that self-reflection is just totally missed, right? This is a really sad story in all reality. Sure. Is it though, Debbie? Is it really a sad act? Like, let's really think about that. He was paid $10 million to write this book and he's paid $30 million to write three more of these books. He was paid $100 million for a Netflix deal. He was paid $20 million for a Spotify deal. He has a gorgeous, hot, American wife. He doesn't have to live with the pressures of being in the royal family. They live, what, in Montecito? They're here in LA now. They're here in SoCal. How is, like, how is it really a sad story? He didn't want to be a part of the royal family, so he broke away from the royal family. He now gets to live a life with his beautiful wife and his beautiful children in a beautiful home, and they're racking in hundreds of millions. Hundreds of millions. It's not about the money. I know. It's not about the money. What about his gorgeous family? And the fact that he no longer has to be part of this awful family that was so mean to him and the press that was so brutal to him and so brutal to his wife. Like, it sounds like they're living a happy ending. Why? So at what point is this sad? Poor me, write a book, imagine. Like, listen, I do want to have empathy for him, but it's like, how do I feel bad for him crying about having such a terrible life when it's like his life didn't end up that terrible? His life seems pretty damn good at this point. I would love to be racking it. If Netflix wants to pay me $100 million and Random House wants to pay me $30 million or $40 million, right? It was $40 million, $10 million per book. Yeah, $40 million for a Random House book deal and $100 million for a Netflix deal, and $20 million for a Spotify deal, and I got to have a hot smoking wife and two beautiful children without the pressures of having to be in the UK living in the royal family. Privacy, privacy, privacy. I mean, but I don't think they really want privacy. I think they want the money and the fame, and good for them, but like, own it, baby, own it. They lost their brother. Oh, it's sad for William, the Queen, Charles, et cetera. So, okay, got it. it. I mean, apparently, according to Harry, they didn't care about him. I mean, I guess it is awful that they have to get dragged through all of this. Like, they really are getting dragged. I mean, the fact that you're telling stories of your father, who's now the king in his boxers, standing on his head to try and help his back pain, and how his wife is leaking things, the queen, or is she the queen? She's not considered the queen. Is Camilla the queen? No, he's the king and she's Princess Camilla. That's another thing I'm confused about. But yeah, she's leaking stories about her stepson to the press. Like, it's interesting. Can you not see how all of that is sad? I can see how there are elements of it that are sad. But I don't think he ended up how sad that this has all come out. Oh, yeah. 
How? Got it, got it, got it. You're saying it's awful that these things are coming out the way that they're coming out. I can see that. Oh, so she is queen. Okay, so Camellia is queen. Queen consort. What does that mean? Camilla is queen consort. What does queen consort mean? Guys, dumb American here. I'm trying to understand it. Um, queen consort, she leaks nothing. I don't think she's leaking things. I mean, come on. That's a big accusation to throw at the queen. She's leaking stories about me doing drugs, smoking weed in the bathroom. When I was smoking weed in the bathroom. Queen consort, so still queen. Got it, got it, got it. So she's queen by marriage. Yeah, she's married to a queen. Got it, got it, got it. Okay. See, I'm learning as many other Americans listening to this podcast. Okay, guys. Thank you. I love you. I appreciate you. I hope you have a wonderful. Oh, shit. Um, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Um, I hope you have fun tonight. Enjoy life. Live life. If you're with your family, if you have your family around you or on FaceTime or whatever, give them love. Give them a hug. Let them, you know, family. I'm very close to my family. So for me, Family is very important. When I was on Jacques' podcast, he was like, the, the biggest question is what dollar amount would it take for you to sell out your own family? And I was like, I don't know if I could sell out my own family. I like made a joke and I was like, well, it depends on like which family member and how much money. And maybe for $40 million, maybe I would sell out my stepmother. Um, listen, life is short. Shit happens. Um, at the end of the day, if you have family, express your love hold them closely and you know or maybe one day you'll get lucky enough to write a 10 million dollar book <sighs> zach can you say we're on appeal for legal reasons yes i can we're on appeal for legal reasons i gave the chris uh, i gave an update on the chrisleys todd and julie chrisley on our instagram account so be sure to follow at no filter with zach for all the latest tea and i do talk about their appeal because they were on appeal for legal reasons and their appeal is ongoing and they were denied bond. So lots of, lots of more tea to come. Stay tuned guys. Listen to hashtag new with Zach Peter on all podcast platforms. Please leave me a nice review. If you're enjoying the podcast, be sure to subscribe, like, and hit the bell notification. That way you always get the notifications when they are hot. All right, guys, I love you. I appreciate you. I got to go run to me. Harry Hamlin. Okay. All right. Ciao for now. Bye guys. Bye, Shishi. Bye, Stephanie. Bye, M. Bye, Brittany. That's Brittany, bitch. Bye, Enda. Bye, Aaron D. All right. Go for now, guys.